Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 843. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is February 13th, 2024. All right, welcome to another episode, and we appreciate you here. This is this is our happy place. George and I sit down once or twice a week in, in front of our webcams with all these little articles we want to talk about, and we click the record button, and lo and behold, you guys like to read, watch that and, and listen to it, and we really appreciate that. Uh, if you didn't know, we have a podcast. You can find that in the show notes if you just want to listen to Anglican Unscripted. Most of you are viewers on YouTube, and we really appreciate that. We appreciate that so much that we ask that you like us if you see this episode on Facebook or on YouTube, because that's free advertising to us. We also want you to go to the show notes and to the comment section and put your comments down on the stuff that we're talking about. We're interested in your opinion. And if by some seldom slim chance we're wrong on a, on a topic, you're welcome to correct us uh, to be more precise because we like accurate reporting. Uh, George, I woke up today and my car here in Central Florida was yellow. And uh, <laughs> yes, my nose is running. My, eyes, <laughs> my nose, my eyes, my ears, everything with pollen season here. It's the uh, live oak pollen is the yellow pollen, but we have is other things it? going on as well as yeah. the flu season. So mm -hmm. a lot of sniffling and coughing on this show today. <laughs> Excuse me, um, but uh, no. It, but the weather is beautiful. It's bright sunshine. I know you'll want to get on your bike this afternoon. I do absolutely. But do you need do you need a, uh, a gas mask or a uh, mask to ride with all this pollen? Yeah, if I go over to the Withatuchi Trail, which is actually kind of close to George. Um, they have different plants that hold 30 miles. And so there's one section, you go, <coughs> but you're okay for the rest of the sections. Now here at the Florida Grand, uh, two weeks ago, we had a, a small run of COVID come through here. Uh, I think about uh, 20 or 30 different people got COVID. And the new latest strain of COVID gives you a fever, gives you a sore throat, and lasts two days. These people all tested positive and um, you know, COVID's slowly washing out now that we have a little bit of uh, natural immunity to it. So we'll see no, what no, happens. No. no, no, no. Natural immunity doesn't work, the CDC tells us. And Dr. Felchie, oh. they tell us that that's not, no protection at all. Okay. I, oh. live with, I, I live with a bunch of people who don't get the jab anymore. <laughs> it's, you know, the, this is conservative Florida. Uh, the jab is conspiracy. So. That's that's what it is, uh, George. How you doing this week? Very good. Busy time. Uh, tonight is the pancake supper. Tomorrow is at, at Trove Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So uh, preparing for that. Susan is the, this year. The Sunday school is running it, meaning the parents are doing it, and they're pre cooking bacon and sausage in my house last night. And tonight they'll warm that up with sausages, half a dozen griddles, and. Mm -hmm. Grown men in aprons and children running around. It'll be a lot of fun. And yeah. tomorrow is Ash Wednesday, and we start the season of Lent. Tomorrow's Valentine's Day. Well, to have a cheap date, come to our <laughs> Shrove Tuesday dinner tonight. <laughs> okay. All right. Actually, Jill and I are going to go out on date night about 5 o'clock uh, tomorrow at a nice restaurant around here. Then we're going to go to the Ash Wednesday service at 7 o'clock and then be back in time for bed. I hope I get to bed earlier nowadays. Let's go over to our news stories, George. You and I discussed 11, 10 or 11 different stories. We see how we get through on time. And uh, you had a story that I had not heard of. We, I titled it The War Between Saints, and it's between the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the Russian Orthodox Church. The Russian Orthodox Church uh, is probably mad because the Ukrainian Orthodox Church just got $95 billion from the U.S. Congress today. But that's a, that's another topic altogether. What's the War of the Saints, George? Well, there's a war in heaven. There is a war in heaven, but yes, there's there also a war in heaven that is arising from the war between Russia and Ukraine. Alexander Nevsky uh, is the great, he's the George Washington of Russia. He, he uh, was the Prince of Bogorod and the Grand Duke of uh of Kiev, 
And at a crucial moment in Russian history, he repelled the Teutonic Knights and the Tartar invasions, and the Mongol Khans. He was a great hero, and he was also a Christian. And for almost, what is that, 800 years, he has been a saint in the Orthodox Church. He's the patron saint of the Russian army. He is uh, uh, very much in favor in the modern Orthodox world. And the Ukrainians, because he's the Russian's hero, have dropped him from the calendar of saints. He has been canceled. So cancer culture has come to the saints calendar. Um, now the Russians uh -huh. are playing this for all this is worth saying. They're playing for all it's worth saying. See, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is really just a puppet of the Zelensky regime. And if they are so base as to drop a, a saint of, of 800 years standing because we like him, they must not be real Christians. And the Ukrainians are responding, well, no, we're not doing that. We're not, not saying he's an evil man, but it just is not appropriate to celebrate the patron of the Russian army while we're fighting them. Probably true. I mean, right now, we here in America, we uh, take our Confederate soldier statues and, and hide them in the closet until uh, sanity returns. But yeah. I can see that. Well, now. I, I, I kind of I, I heard you say cancer culture in my earphones. I think you meant cancel. Is I mean, that just a faux pas? Culture, yes. <laughs> well, you know, Episcopal Church did the Episcopal Church is always on the cutting edge. A mm. uh, year uh, last general convention, we removed William Portia Dubose yeah. from the calendar of from the lesser feasts and fasts. Some called the calendar of saints. Dubose was a professor at Swanning, one of the great Anglican theologians of the late 19th century, mm -hmm. but he was also a chaplain in the Confederate Army and supported the Confederate cause. And because of that, the modern Episcopal Church canceled him. And the, and the convention that canceled William Portia Dubose added Barbara Harris the foul-mouthed bishop of Massachusetts to our calendar because she's the first black woman bishop. Yeah. So, you know, of course, everybody plays games, and not everybody, but, you know, there are games played with calendars of saints and holy men and holy women. You know, every so often the Episcopal Church says, well, there are not enough black women in our calendar of saints. There are not enough in men, people of color and all this and that. And so we go years adding these people no one's ever heard of while excluding people of real, you know, real spiritual integrity. Uh, what shall we do? <laughs> I don't know. All right, so let's move on. Now, Indonesia has probably entered the lexicon of American Unscripted in the last 843 episodes, five seven times tops and you said you have a story from indonesia and you wanted to talk about the changing of the holiday names to the christian holidays and I, it's interesting well, why don't you bring us up to date on that <coughs> indonesia is the world's largest muslim country and it has been fighting a battle against muslim extremism indonesian islam for the most part has been relatively benign compared to, say, Saudi is Islam. It's, it's and, not been rad radicalized. Yeah, there are portions of it, not right. saying it isn't. And, you know, in different parts, uh, Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines and in uh, Acha province in northern Sumatra. But Indonesia celebrates Easter, Good Friday, Christmas, and Ascension Day as national holidays, uh, Christian festivals but they've been given Muslim names ever since Indonesia uh, achieved independence from the Dutch in 48, I believe it was, or maybe, might have been later. Now, the president of Indonesia, uh, Joko Widodo, has now, by a presidential decree, changed the names of national holidays so that now they're called Good Friday, is now called the Day of the Death of Jesus Christ. Easter is now called the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's now called Jesus Christ instead of Isa al-Masih. In other words, they're Christianizing their secular national calendar. And so for Christians in that part of the world, this is a major event. Remember, there was this big, long controversy in North in Malaya, Malaysia, where 
they didn't want you to use the word uh, Allah for God yeah. because that's the God of the Islam Muslims. Well, Christians have that Allah in their Bible for God, the Father. And for the Indonesian government to uh, basically give a symbolic statement that they're Christian minority, which maybe is as high as 10, 12% of the population, uh, that's a significant step for Christian freedom. Um, so the good news for once on the Christian freedom front. Or it could be a cynical ploy to get the Christian votes for the national party in their upcoming national election. I, as a Christian, I take it. Yeah, whatever, whatever. Sometimes you got to take whatever it takes. So um, let's move on to some immigration. Uh, anybody who's been following American politics for the last uh, uh, eight years uh, with Trump and with Biden know that immigration here in America is a huge issue. We have uh, immigrants from all nations. Now, I mean, last month, one of the leading nations coming through the southern border were, were Chinese people. The month before that were people from the continent of Africa. The, the month before that was Venezuela and other southern countries. We, and they're coming through by the thousands, 12,000 a day, 32,000 a day. And the governors of Texas and the governors of uh, um, uh, other bordering states are shipping them by bus to places like New York City, to Chicago, to Denver, I don't, I don't know. They don't want to pay the bus fare to get them to San Francisco, but they should. And so all of the, the liberal or democratic uh, cities are sharing in this immigration battle right now. And there's a lot of complaining going on. We thought I, they would just end up it. in Texas. <laughs> you know, I love it that Governor Abbott of Texas has buses drop off illegal immigrants right in front of the vice president's mansion. Uh, in Washington, D.C. Okay. I think that was, okay. <coughs> you know, it's upsetting to some, but I thought it was a political, politically astute optical move. But, uh, well, and, but, and here are the optics. Uh, every nation I know of that I've traveled to uh, in all my years with Anglican TV had border control. Uh, it, you were not allowed to uh, go into that country illegally. You, they had a, a, a significant customs president, presence at the border. Uh, here in America, and now in the UK, and some other nations, we're starting to slide on what border means, what immigration means, uh, what uh, legal and, we can't say illegal immigration, but we're kind of sliding on that. And it's, it's interesting to see the church was always had an opinion on this, uh, Archbishop Welby, for, for the longest time. I see a little battle brewing between former Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, and current Archbishop, hopefully soon to be former Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. Uh, describe what's going on there. Well, th this arises uh, from uh, an at an opinion piece George Carey published in the Sunday Telegraph this past Sunday, the, the uh, this past Sunday. Um, England is one of two nations in the world where members of the of the clergy are automatically given seats in, in their legislature. Right. The others are wrong, which is not a good club to belong to. And there are bishops in the House of Lords. Not every bishop is a member of the House of Lords, but senior bishops or members of the House of Lords. And the bishops, the Church of England bishops in the House of Lords have been uniformly lockstep liberal votes. And the conservatives have been criticizing the bishops of the Church of England for opposing plan, various government plans to deal with the immigration crisis facing Britain. And Justin Welby has called, you know, the government's plan to send illegal immigrants who are trying to cross the channel by boat to Britain, send them to Rwanda for vetting to see if they truly are refugees for reasons of uh, conscience, or are they just young men who want a better life or to live in a welfare hotel and uh, sponge off the British taxpayer. Justin Welby said those who oppose that policy are immoral. Welby is wrapping uh, the, the opposition to immigration controls in a Church of England blanket that says good people only think this way. Well, George Carey popped into the, art on, into the argument on Sunday by saying, no, Justin, you're wrong. 
the Church of England should be commended for seeking the good and welfare of all people, but by the same time, nations and borders have meaning. And when you are destroying uh, British, it's not the, the people who live in, the, uh, in Surrey or in uh, Surbiton who are being afflicted by the mass immigration, it's the working men and women who are seeing their towns and communities change beyond all recognition. And the Church of England needs to respond to the concerns of the average Briton who is opposed to allowing these fraudulent immigrants to come. And this also ties into a major news, news item that has scandalized Britain about an Afghan immigrant who had been convicted of sex crimes but then converted, but then said he converted to Christianity and produced a letter from a Baptist church in the north of England saying, I'm a good Christian. And the government said, okay, you can stay because you can't go back to Afghanistan as a Christian because they'll kill you. And he's now proceeded to attack some people with acid or an alkali. And he's, there's a massive manhunt. And his friends say, well, this was a fraud all along. He was a good Muslim. He was just saying this to avoid deportation. Well, I need to stop you there. I was under the impression that if you were a Christian, you could not immigrate, use that as an immigration statement from a different country. If I were a Christian from Iran and I wanted to go into the UK, that would not be enough protection for me. That's true. And we've had uh, statements in the House of Lords and in Parliament, uh, uh, Baroness Caroline Cox, for instance, who is a member of the House of Lords, who is an advocate for Christians who are persecuted, has pointed out that the proportion of Christian Syrians, for example, and Syria has a Christian minority, who are welcomed into Britain is much lower than their proportion of the Syrian population. In fact, the British government actively discriminates against Christians who flee Iran and go to Turkey, or Syrian Christians, or Pakistani Christians, they are put at the back of the line and ahead of them are Muslims. And this is not a stated policy, but it is the de facto policy of the Home Office and various British agencies. And as well as in the United States, we see that uh, ratio where <coughs> we are welcoming, if you will, people who are belonging to a religion or culture that does not, is not wish to climatize is not part of our culture. Now, not all Muslim immigrants don't wish to climatize, but these immigrants from South Asia who moved to Britain or Somalia, or um, they form their own little pockets of Arabia mm -hmm. on uh, England's green and pleasant land. So yes, if, if this acid thrower had been, Chris, had been converted to Christianity while in Afghanistan, he'd never be in Britain. But once he got to Britain, he could convert and get out, get a jail, get out of jail free card. Well, we have a uh, regular viewer uh, on our program. I'm not going to mention his name just because he's, I, I think at this point, an anonymous source who says uh, it's regular for asylum seekers to be baptized so they won't be kicked out. Oh, he's no longer an anonymous. Matthew first sure. went okay. and told his story. He told his story to the Telegraph. Okay. When Matthew was a uh, vicar in Darlington, which is in the Diocese of Durham, when he got there, he found there's, as they call it, a conveyor belt. Uh, he, adult men and women who were asylum seekers who had come to the church to be baptized, and then their lawyers would say, write me a certificate and... And basically, there was no preparation, follow. There's no way to check. They, they, in order to make the statistics of adult baptisms look good, the administration and work of the Diocese of Durham, where, where Matthew was, colluded with immigration fraud. Um, another uh, viewer, uh, James Pace, had a letter in the, in, in the Telegraph where he said in 2019, when he was a curate, 1999, well, Whatever. 1999, <laughs> he was a curate and they, they had an Iranian woman uh, convert to Christianity and, and want to be baptized. And they had an Iranian Baptist pastor in Brighton 
basically check the verification, you know, verify that this woman was a real bona fide Christian and not just someone trying to game the system so as not to go back to Iran. So this is not new. And, and in Brighton, 20 odd years ago, they would check these people. But there are a number of British dioceses who just want the statistics to look great. And this has caused, caused questions in Parliament. It's called outrage. Justin Welby responded by saying, oh, we are being kind and loving and good. How dare you say we're doing this? And then... Uh, uh, but wasn't he the Bishop, bishop. of Durham? Uh, he had been the Bishop of Durham. <laughs> okay, bishop just checking on it. <laughs> and then Bishop Gulley, Francis Dekani, who mm. is uh, who came from Iran. Her mother was English. Her father was the Bishop of Iran. She was a refugee as well. She then made a, a statement to one of the newspapers. Well, perhaps there are people taking advantage. Uh, but we essentially have to accept the good for the bad in a liberal society. So... <clears throat> So George Gary now steps in and says, look, start thinking about the British man and woman, what this is doing to them. They're paying the taxes to support these people. They're, there's a housing crisis in Britain. We may complain about the cost of housing and the ability to get on the housing ladder in the United States. You know, I've told many stories about the outrageous rent my daughter pays in San Francisco and whatnot. Well, in Britain, it's far worse. London, and so absolutely. There's, yeah, yeah. yeah, so there's a generation arising that are going to basically be in rented accommodation, you know, all their lives because the housing stock is so expensive and they're not building enough housing because of the greeny weeny policies. And what housing stock they do have is being set aside and reserved for immigrants. And so there's just as... Uh, we're at a... Berlin Wall time, if you will, uh, and this is East Germany, where something's going to fall and crack soon, because, you know, it just is not possible to continue with this destruction of British identity, British culture, British American values. American identity, yeah, absolutely. No, American I'm, it, culture, American, yeah. Canadian identity, Canadian yeah. culture, Canadian yeah. values. Yeah. It's all, um, um, it's all going to come to a head. I don't know when. I don't know how, but I just sense it. Well, I'm able to speak of immigration and uh, illegal immigration and uh, migrants from a biblical level. Uh, at a political level, it's a little bit of a, my pay grade, and there's a lot that happens uh, in the international uh, scheme of things. But as an observer, as a journalist, I look from where these immigrants are coming from, and they're not coming from capitalist societies they're not coming from uh places where um there's a democratic government uh they're coming from places that they are fearing and the the economy is horrible venezuela uh ecuador yeah you just go through all these different places in the south or over in china or some african nations um that they're fleeing poverty and economics and politics to come to the U.S., well, right now, we are mad at our capitalism. We blame our white people. We, I mean, it's a mess for the liberals to invite people into something they don't like. They hate America, and yet they open mm -hmm. the doors. So, I don't know. Once again, over my pay grade. Well, Kevin, you know, I, I was sharing with you. Uh, we were late filming today because I had a walk-in. I had a walk-in oh. client. Oh, I had a fellow come in. Uh I could tell by his accent, you know, he was from Appalachia, West sure. Virginia, perhaps. Um, he's a man down on his luck. He had five kids and his wife in the car. Uh, they're looking for a place to live, looking for a place to stay. They've been living in their car, you know, looking for work because the work he had and this that was gone. He was gone, you know, trip. He, 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 need, he was asking for a handout, but he was counseling it. Is there anything I can do sure. to make money? And so my wife had given me some, my wife gave me $200 to do something today. And of course I said, <clears throat> you know, okay, I'll call my junior warden and we'll have you trim trees and I'll give you 200 bucks. 
So when my, over my wife gives me cash, I come home with a bag of magic beans. That's yes. just the way I am. Good job, Jim. Why do I say that? <laughs> our, our working white poor, our working black poor, who fall between the cracks, who don't have, we don't have housing, we don't have unskilled labor, we don't have the things that traditionally would allow these people to support themselves. We're outsourcing. And I can see the sentiment of a church wanting to help those in need. But at the end of the day, is my compassion better directed at the man with the five kids and the wife in the car or the 22 year old Venezuelan who, you know, is looking to start a new life in the United States? Yeah. Um, but the thing is here with the Venezuelan, 99 chances out of 100, he's a Christian. And he may in time become fully acclimatized. And I have a number of immigrants in my congregation who are have bought into the American dream. They have acculturated. The problem that Britain is saying is that they're bringing in people who will not acculturate. They will not. They refuse to. And they want Britain to acculturate to their uh, pathologies that they've run away from in Pakistan and Somalia and Ethiopia and these places there if any of our regular viewer cranks and trolls who like to say nasty things there was your opportunity to pile on pile on uh you and i could make just a video once a week uh reading comments and responding to comments uh that that would be and we could put it under a paywall we'd make a mint george yeah well you know you what i'm impressed with is the number of people who can read my mind or, or your mind, Kevin. <laughs> it's a, they which know is pretty exactly empty. Good luck. Yeah. deepest yeah. thoughts and our inner motivations. They've got us uh, cold. They really do. I mean, it's amazing. All right, let's move on to our next story. We've completely... Uh, to, oh, okay, so two weeks ago, uh, I put a little clickbait uh, on the title for our episode, and I think uh, Pope Francis commissions women bishops, which is a true story. Um, and we find out last <coughs> week that the the cardinal, the Council of Cardinals, uh, was having a meeting, and they invited women clergy and some Roman Catholic women to discuss the future of women and women's ministries within the Roman Catholic Church. A, a grand thing to discuss, George. Now, because you and I are journalists, we've been privy to what was discussed and what may happen before the retirement of Pope Francis. I, I, yeah, okay, when, when, we discuss, on, when, when we discussed this this morning, George, my thought was all the people who, who swam and went over to become Roman Catholic because there would never, they would never, this was a firewall they would never achieve. And then the blessing of same sex unions was a, fi a firewall they would never ever achieve because Rome. Or the Vatican, or the Pope has a magisterium about it, and it, it, it ain't gonna happen, Kevin. I'm leaving Anglicanism for better pastures. That's what I was thinking about well, in our discussion this morning. Different pastures, and yes, they don't seem as better these days. As no. Better. The Council of Cardinals is a body of nine cardinals who come from all the different parts of the Catholic world. Uh, Catholic world. So they're selected on uh, sort of geographic distribution. And they, in essence, are a sort of a standing committee or steering committee for the larger College of Cardinals. Mm -hmm. And Francis convened the, the Council of Cardinals. And we reported that Joe Bailey Wells, who was the former Bishop of Dorking and is now a bureaucrat at the Anglican Consultative Council, Evidently, she's gotten a promotion because she's now called the Vice General Secretary of the Deputy General Secretary of the Anglican Consultative Council. And she was invited and discussed women's orders, along with a uh, Spanish uh, religious, which is a, a nun, and a, an Italian woman theologian. Well, in something called Religion Digital, which is a daily news service put out by in Spanish from the uh, Catholic Church in Spain. It's independent of the church. 
th this uh, religious shared what the meeting was all about in detail. Evidently, Pope Francis invited uh, the women to discuss the issue of deacons in the Catholic Church, women deacons. Uh, you, mean well, deaconess to... you, oh, you mean women deaconesses? No, I do no. not win, mean women deaconesses. Uh, women deaconesses are ordered, are made. They are not ordained. Right. Deacons are ordained. It's an order of ministry. And Francis has expressed to these people whom he invited and to the cardinals present his desire to have women deacons. And Joe Bailey Wells was asked to speak on the uh, experiment of women clergy in the Anglican world, how women deacons have worked, have not worked, women priests, women bishops. And the two Catholics were asked to give theological and historical uh, points on this. And so, friend, so that what we've come out of this meeting in the Spanish media, which we're going, I'm going to write up once I make sure I got my dictionary in front of me and make sure I can understand everything I'm reading. Oh, I only speak Taco Bell Spanish at this stage. I've got to check my languages. But the Francis, before he goes, wants to have women deacons. Now, just so to give you a bit point of reference, the Russian Orthodox Church has women deacons. We're not ordered. They're not deaconesses. They right. are women who are basically nuns already who are given higher office in the church at convents. So they're not running around in each parish. And the Egyptian Orthodox Church, which is not the Coptic, but the other Orthodox Church in Egypt, their synod approved women deacons. So there are two, and there may be a third. It's one of the Caucasian countries, Georgia, Armenia. But they're very common on the ground. And the Greeks have women deacons, very, okay. but not very common. Mm -hmm. And these are not deaconesses in the old Episcopal sense of basically church-affiliated social workers, teachers, le le uh, lay catechists. These are ordained women. And Francis, one of the things he wishes to have, according to this article, his legacy will be women deacons. Now this, I think, once it gets into the English language world, in the Catholic world, will cause a bit of an explosion. Because if you look at the theology of orders that we have in the Western world, Anglicans, Catholics, whatnot, once you admit women to the order of deacon, there's no logical reason not to do it to priest. And then once they're priests, there's no reason not to do it to bishops. And then archbishops. Yeah. yeah. So <coughs> we've had a great deal of fun and a great deal of grief reporting upon the contretemps over the Mere Anglican Conference, where there was the fight over, was Calvin Robinson rude and boorish over women priests, or was he speaking truth to power? Well, just wait till this same argument hits the Catholic world and the genteel people of Charleston will be seen as angels of light compared to what goes down in Poland and other places when this really hits, gets going. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> as I said, as we said, Kevin, you and I, we, you, if you doubt us, friends, look at the old things. Well, when Francis was elected Pope, we said he was a secret Episcopalian. And I dare you to disprove it at this time. No, yeah. I mean, look you know, at the uh, actions. Bob. Look at what he is. Look what he proposes. Look what people said. Listen to what Greg Venable said all those years ago about his good buddy, uh, Fra uh, Jorge. Paul Francis. Jorge yep, yep. Bergoglio, which is yeah, Francis's yeah. secular name. So. Well, now, it, would we, when we had the consecration uh, to the throne of Archbishop of. Uh, uh, Archbishop Foley Beach, uh, Venables gave up and said, I was contacted by Pope Francis and he wanted me to extend wishes of goodwill to you. Would that happen again with the next Archbishop? Would we allow uh, the voice of the Pope to, to, to be received loudly at the consecration? Oh, absolutely. Because the institutional Anglican and Catholic right. worlds are engaged in a love feast. Now, 
the liberal Anglican establishment and the liberal Catholic establishment are falling all over themselves. Uh, and this takes us back two weeks to the commissioning of Anglican women bishops to go with their Catholic counterparts out and go and make disciples for all nations. Well, my goodness, when Francis is laying hands on people to go out and make disciples of all nations and their Anglican women bishops, one from Mexico City, the other from Amazonia, we got some symbolism here that you cannot run away from. So that if we get another liberal Anglican in Canterbury, which odds are, because Francis, uh, sorry, Justin Welby was supposed to be, the, you know, we had a liberal, we had a conservative George Carey, a liberal yeah. Roman Williams, a yeah. conservative just evangelical Justin Welby out of the Alpha Movement. Alpha Movement, yeah. And so now it's time for who? Stephen Cottrell, you know, somebody from the liberal Catholic movement, just if we play the flip-flop game. It's not a perfect game, but it seems to have looked that way in our lifetimes. And if Francis is able to pack the College of Cardinals with people who, who are of like mind to him, and we don't go back to someone like uh, another Ratzinger or John Paul, but we get somebody liberal from Northern Europe or Brazil, yes, the love feast will continue. Could you imagine in the eyes of the world... If 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 the the Bishop of London became the next Archbishop of Canterbury, and the next Pope was liberal, and we saw the same pictures we always see of Welby and Pope Francis together in the news, praying for each other, laying on hands of each other, doing all the all that boy boy uh, fun stuff, um, what would the world think? Well, uh, what would happen with the well, Roman well, Catholic I mean, Church? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, go ahead. Uh, some insiders, insiders, insiders baseball at this <laughs> <That's> stage. <right. laughs> but many of you will know that I uh, was very fortunate to attend a uh, course in Rome last spring uh, on exorcism, which is the formal training course for exorcists in the Catholic Church. And in recent years, that had been opened to non-Catholic clergy. And in our class of 150-odd people, uh, there were two people from the Episcopal Church, uh, a laywoman from the ACNA, and a priest from the ACNA. And there was somebody, I think, and a woman from the Church of Sweden. But I think everybody else was Roman Catholic. Well, a uh, friend of this show, friend of ours of longstanding, Frank Lyons, Assistant Bishop of the sure. Diocese of the South, Mm -hmm. Asked me, you know, George, I think this is something that our people could really get involved in. And, you know, and so I send the details. And Frank, Bishop Lyons, Bishop Frank wrote back a few months ago saying, well, you know, we're looking at the uh, uh, application materials and it says you need to have be signed off by your Catholic bishop. Did you have to do this? No, I just had to be signed off by Bishop Greg Brewer, my bishop at the time. And well, what they did is they changed it. They, in essence, closed it. To Catholic clergy again. And to, to Anglican clergy. To closed it to only closed it so that it was only Catholic clergy. Okay. And okay. religious, you know, hmm. nuns and what can I go. Well, I called, I had made some friends there. One of them was an Australian who lives in Rome, who's a priest. And I said, Well, you know, what's going on? You know, why the doors? He said, Well, it's the politics of Rome. When the conservatives are feeling stronger they're able to sort of tweak here. And it's the liberal Catholics who want to invite you pagans and schismatics and heretics, you Anglican, we say this jokingly, uh, to the to this thing. I said, oh, okay. Well, I didn't share that because that's not exactly polite, but, uh, but I checked last night again. And now the applications have been changed once again so that the liberals are just in and are the liberal star is rising once again in the vatican internal wars and now anglicans can go to the conference again where they don't need good. their catholic bishop signature they just need their anglican bishop signature good good, good. so friends sign up if if frank <laughs> yeah. lance wants you to go spend the money go. worth every oh, dime worth every yeah. dime yeah. and it's a wonderful ministry and and but second this is the sort of thing we're seeing, you know, within the Catholic wars, conservatives take take the lead because Francis mm -hmm. is weak and getting old, but ah, now we've got Cardinal Fernandez and those teams are around him and they're getting liberal. And so 
this is how we see it play out in little things. Uh, little things like having two South American women bishops co commissioned by the Pope. Little things like having pagans like George Conger's friends from the ACNA and the Episcopal Church go to a Catholic training session that's only for Catholic, real Catholics. For goodness sakes, I'm an evangelical. I'm not even an Anglo-Catholic. And they no, let me go. No, come on. That's, that's just crazy talk. Crazy talk. All right. Well, let's let's get back to some more fun news. Um, I'm taking you way back here, but in my second year of college, and probably until 1993, yes. God, God was in heaven. Ronald Reagan was in the White <laughs> House. President. That's right. All yeah. was right in the world. At that time, I was a disc jockey. Okay, I, I ran a a, a a disc jockey service where we'd show up to. Um, class reunions, weddings, and I had uh, some disc jockeys who worked for me and was building my, my entrepreneur skills, plus my entertainment skills. And uh, um, I, I Did you have a mullet or did you have sideburns? Uh, I, I had the mullet. Uh, I'll take a second here. You're looking at a picture right now of Kevin from 1986 uh, with my mullet and my sports jacket and uh, this is taken by a friend at, at one of my disc jockey gigs. And so frequently, not all the time, but at least three or four times a year, I would play a uh, wedding reception in a church, in the reception hall. Okay. And uh, the people who paid me, their families would get, get together and dance. There would be a nice <coughs> weird ball shining uh, lights around the reception area. The 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 lights I set up would be uh, uh, flashing on the little dance floor, and people would come up and have a grand old time. Now, now, would you play Disco Inferno or? Uh... I, I would certainly play uh, a, a vast array from the fifties hip hop, uh, hip hop. No, the fifties was uh, a sock hop music uh, to the seventies love songs and the eighties pop music. And well, I stopped in ninety, so I can't say Locker anything. Like, and, uh... I can't say about anything about grunge, but uh, and so it was a fun time and. I nobody had trouble with having a DJ in the wedding reception in the reception hall. Never played in the in the sanctuary. Never played in the nave. So our next story, uh, believe it or not, uh, I'm going to uh, transfer the video over here so I don't uh, um, lose anything. Is a, a a rave at a church called Canterbury. I don't see that many young people. I see a great deal of United States boys with soccer moms yeah. with uh, their Campari and soda and a little light stick. Um, I don't think this was quite the uh, audience that they wanted to have. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but, okay, and so the discussion now on the Twitterverse and social media and around the world is, by God, what have they done to can the, the Canterbury Cathedral? Well, let's dance on the bones of Thomas of Beckett. <laughs> I know. There's to, martyrs. Uh, there, there, are, there are martyrs buried in this building. Well, to me, the fact that they would play the Pet Shop Boys inside a British cathedral just to me is a desecration worse than anything else but there we go West Ham boys okay I know I get it yeah. but, okay so yeah, what's the, what's going on this has been a long growing story and our good friend Gavin Ashenden has been one of the more prominent commentators in the British press on this mm -hmm. the uh, Dean of uh, Canterbury the new Dean wants to make the church relevant and hip and he wanted to have a way where the cathedral could be a venue for people celebrating life and having joy. And they thought, well, a rave in the nave. Well, there's not a real rave because I don't think it was, the people that we saw in the picture, if they went to a real rave would have finished about nine o'clock. Uh, <laughs> this was not a, a an ecstasy uh, fuel techno pop. This was, it is what yeah. it is. 
Yeah, this is what it is. Okay, but and so they said, oh, it's just a disco, uh, uh, disco uh, revival, just to get people in, because you know they said that when Rochester Cathedral put in the, um, we call it mini golf. Uh, I don't know what they call it, Brittany Grand Crazy Golf. Uh, the we call it putt putt, 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 golf, putt golf. Yep. And was it Rochester had the putt putt golf, and then somebody else, or was it Rochester who had the helter skelter, the slide, helter skelter, yeah, or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah, the cathedrals. They said, "Oh well, we saw a great deal of increase in traffic in the weeks that followed." But they, te- but that, that traffic was not at worship; it was in tourism. So, Cathed- Canterbury Cathedral's dean made the same argument. This will increase foot traffic through the cathedral. And it has caused cries of outrage where Gavin Ashton says, if you don't want to use the cathedral properly, give it back to the Catholics who build it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's never going to happen. (laughs) And then other people saying that, you know, this is abomination. And then we've got atheists and secularists writing uh, at Guardian columnists, putting on, on Twitter and Facebook that, you know, I may not be a Christian, but that's just this bad taste. And I agree. Okay. This isn't bad taste. Now, to defend it, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral had ballet and classical music played uh, a few years ago, and nobody made a scene because perhaps that is sort of uh, more uh, refrained, uh, 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 refined. Uh, So is it the type of music or is it using the cathedral for a secular purpose that's a problem? Well, you know, cathedrals all through Britain, you know, show movies, they have art installations. I forget which cathedral it was, uh, Salisbury that had a Gaia earth thing that, you know, frankly, pagan earth mother thing. Um, the cathedral, the, just the attacks on the cathedral, if you just leave it at being aesthetically vulgar, they fall away. But we really do need a more defined understanding of what sacred space is for. If it's for weddings and funerals, then Kevin and his mullet can go and play Disco Inferno or be DJ Jazzy Jess and, you know, move the turntable oh, backwards. On, and Everybody dance now. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or, uh, or play... You know, like the crowd that we saw in the video there looks like they're all about to sing Come On Irene. You know, it's that level of, uh, of musical uh, sophistication. Um, but I really would like to see some work saying what our sacred space is for, not just in a Catholic sense, yeah. but in a whole Christian sense. Why is it important that we preserve this church? Is it a cult- you know, is it purely cultural? Or is there something about God's presence or God's work that these buildings symbolize? And until we really get that work done, and I'm sure it has been done, but it certainly has not spread out into the common mind, then the best arguments will always be aesthetic, that this is vulgar. And George and Kevin sniggering at these silly people, rather than being able to say, you know, this is not what God has in plan for that place. Eh. <clears throat> well, it's a great story. It's got the interest of uh, the internet, and I like reading what other people think. And that's why I have a comment section. Now, if you go and, to and if you other... miss come on Irene and the Pet Shop Boys, West End yeah. Girls, and whatnot, yeah, yeah. go to your British Cathedral and you'll be able to hear That's the a... Brit, Brit pop of the eighties and nineties. Yeah, but I have a if you go to there's a magazine called the Living Church. They don't allow you to comment in any of the articles. Okay, there's a no comment section there. If you go to uh, Christianity Today magazine, there's no commenting allowed. Not allowed to comment. Most Christian periodicals don't allow commenting because there's lots of trolls out there and <coughs> idiots. And, and we have a, our variety here, too. I, I have a, uh, a, a moderator who does an excellent job at Anglican.inc who tries to keep the trolls at, at bay. A couple get through. It's okay. Um and I want you guys to comment in the comment section on this YouTube channel what you think about raves in the nave. What do you think about allowing secular society into the worship area of a church? And, and where's yeah. the line? 
Where's the line? Yeah, and I, yeah, look, I'm not look, judging one way or the Lake other. Okay, but the Pet yeah. Shop Boys bad. Mm-hmm. You know, we're. I don't know. What so, is a, yeah. a theological line that we can defend? <laughs> okay. Fun story of the week, George. We, we get the fun story of the week is not the rave of the knave. Albany priest slashes tires of ex girlfriend. <gasps> That's a fun story. <laughs> well, he was at nine. <laughs> so. uh, one of the the great tragedy of the Episcopal Church in 2023 was the flipping of the diocese of Albany. Yep, where the clergy. Bill Love was forced out. And two bishops, interim bishops, were appointed in Carol Gallagher and Michael Smith. Mm-hmm. Carol Gallagher is a hardcore liberal. Michael Smith is, on paper, a conservative. Gallagher advanced an agenda. Smith played defense. And over the in the interim, some priests were brought into Albany. So and. The culture was changed such that the lay people went over to the left because there was no one to speak up. Smith did not defend the traditional faith. He just let, you know, go along to get along. Um, and one of the people brought in was this rector of an Albany church. And if you go to the Albany church's website, there are, are uh, inclusive church stickers, integrity stickers. Oh, we can't wait to do our first gay blessing, this and that. So, you know, one of the things that Florida and Central Florida and some of the other dioceses have done, the bishops have been gatekeepers. They've kept the church on an even keel by being selective in their clergy when Bill Love did this. Well, in Albany, we had a story that first appeared in the Albany Times Union, and then I picked it up, and uh, a 48-year-old priest who had come in in 2022 from the Diocese of Eau Claire, which was once Anglo-Catholic in Wisconsin, but is now Anglo-Catholic, liberal Catholic. And he came into the church, and he hired a woman to be the uh, communications assistant. She was a contract employee. And he initiated a romantic relationship with her in July. And by December, they were planning a weekend away before Christmas. Well, on the car, they had a fight and the relationship ended in acrimony and nasty texts were exchanged between the two. And in the second week of January, he slashed her tires in a Allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. You know, CCTV cameras don't lie or no, no. whatever, but AI, know. I guess, can make them lie. But <laughs> he has been charged with misdemeanor mischief, uh, vandalism, mischief. And uh, because there's no bishop, the bishop will be consecrated at the end of this month. The standing committee basically has put this on ice. And, uh, you know, if this were central Florida first, He's not married and he's sleeping with her. He's he's sleeping with an employee. He's, you know, it's just not how you do it. No. And then gauge in vandalism, uh, allegedly. Allegedly. Is, and you wonder why Albany flipped. Well, these are the people they brought in. Yeah. Diocese of Florida to our north, they... The, they elected Charlie Holt, very narrow margin. Not just once. And twice. And there is a small but vociferous liberal minority in that diocese that complained, well, Sam Howard, the old bishop, kept out gay clergy and tried to keep this place on the straight and narrow. And that is racist. I don't understand that. but And also uh, disallowed because Sam Howard is not allowed to pick who his priests are because gay clergy should be free. Butterflies are free and gay clergy should be free to go everywhere. And Sam wouldn't let them in. So now they're going through this reconciliation process, which really has turned into uh, someone sent from 815, a retired Bishop, Mary Gray Reeves, who was a bit of a dud as Bishop of El Camino Real. Um, that's but that's not a little yeah yeah come on yeah she's a pleasant her. woman now yeah, but you know nothing yeah. special about her episcopacy she retired early 
And she now goes around trying to do reconciliation and healing. But the reconciliation and healing in the Diocese of Florida means you mean conservatives for standing on what you believe in. And what's going to happen is, you know, they've got uh, the former Bishop of Georgia who was in, on board with the gay agenda is now the acting bishop. And he is, uh, you know, new clergy being brought in. And Florida, when they have another Episcopal election, will flip. I'm absolutely confident of that. It's short of the work of the Holy Spirit to keep save that place. It's the same path in Albany. Um, a minority, once they reach a certain size, can force their views on the majority uh, and basically destroy an institution. They largely can do that here within the church because they are in leadership roles. Okay, mm -hmm. The most liberal faction of the Episcopal Church is its leadership. Mm -hmm. Not the laity, not most of the clergy, but the leadership from 815 to the, the office of the Episcopates around the country, um, that's where you find this uh, forsaken liberalism. Mm -hmm. And that's how they can do it. Here in America, in our um, the tyranny of the minority is propagated by a, a horrible media. Our media is what props up the, the, the voices of the minority and makes it just we a had, tyranny. You know? We had a deanery meeting before Christmas, and we had a liberal woman priest there who's got a little mission, and she wanted to go on and on and on about how we should uh, support the Episcopal Church. We should get involved. Deanery wants to support youth ministry. Good, noble, wonderful thing. Then we, uh, uh, then she said, well, what that means is that we need to go into the schools and support gay and lesbian teenagers and form gay clubs and this and that. And I said, and, and all the other clergy there are like looking at their navel going, oh God, I, we don't want this here. We don't want us have this discussion. We want to talk about anything but this. And I guess I've reached the point where, where that I've already been dean. I don't never going to get elected to anything else, so I can be cranky. And I said, "Look, I am not going to into a, into a school and teach the way of damnation and perdition to young people." Yeah. You know what do you think you're doing? Our church, you know, is, is growing and is healthy by teaching people the unfiltered, un, un, the unwoke word of Jesus Christ. And the problem with the Episcopal Church has always been that careerists, who are the ones who rise to the top, have to be nice and don't say, "I'm little lady, your view has a, has a worth and a merit, and we should hear it. And after a certain point, I just feel like saying, your view has been tried. It's shown to be failed everywhere it's tried. And it's more important for me to save five kids who I'm looking at right now outside as their father's trimming trees, we're playing in our Sunday school yard. It's more important for me to reach those children with the gospel of Jesus Christ than it is for the imaginary unicorns that you see lurking behind every high school gay club. Um, I'm sorry, I sound cranky. I have a cold. Excuse me. Yes, sir. No, no, yeah. <clears throat> but, unless, but unless you're willing to fight locally, um, you will lose nationally. And Episcopal clergy have been trained to be nice and not to fight. Well, the Episcopal yeah. clergy have taught to uh, uh, worship the minority. We've been taught, we've been, well, I don't even believe that, I believe that if you had a new leadership strata, the vast majority of clergy would shift back to the old ways mm -hmm. simply because they want a happy life. And I hate, I hate, it's, it's like the army today. The military is going through a terrible crisis of wokeness at the very top. And all these captains, majors, and colonels are deciding, you know, do I go along to get along or do I get out now? And what game do I have to play? All right. Okay, we're, we're down to one minute, George. I'm going to skip the well-being Ukraine story. Who cares? I'm going to skip the last story I'm that I... Nobody according to our viewership on <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Okay, Kevin, I have, to, I have to tell you, yeah. Uh, uh, the cathedral conference in Lund, Sweden, is getting five times the readers as Welby's statement on the Ukraine. So does that tell us we really have a secret Swedish audience we haven't really exploited? 
or Justin Welby, just people don't care anymore. What is that telling me? Who? Uh, okay. So uh, last story quickly, gun violence has turned its uh, uh, sights on Joe Olstein's church, a uh, man slash lady slash um, Palestinian protester slash immigrant uh, went in with a trench coat, started shooting up mo- instantly. Uh, she was uh, uh, shot by two people, lay people in the church who had guns. This is Texas. And uh, she was not able to uh, kill 40, 50, 60 people. Uh, it's interesting because of who we're trying to figure out who she is, George. Mm-hmm. Well, we know they're an El Salvadorian. We don't know if it's a man or a woman. I can't tell because they're a transgender person and they're referred to in so many different ways in the secular media. I'm not quite sure. But a crazy person with a criminal record uh, walked into Lakewood Church in Houston with an AK-47 with the words Palestine on it. And two good Samaritans prevented a massacre. Well, no. So, if it says Palestine, that weapon may have been provided by the UN. You know, for all intents and, and purposes. And it, it may be by a one of the you know, what you know, we're told by uh, presiding Bishop Michael Curry, the greatest terrorist threat doesn't come from the Middle East; it comes from white nationalists amongst us. She, this, this, he or she may have been gunning for Palestinians. That's why they had Palestine on the rifle. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. So the, this morning, the Houston Police Department did a little press conference. They're going to play 26 seconds of it. Uh, I have to turn a button on here. Don't talk until the end, George, or you'll do some echoing. But uh, I'm going to turn the, the monitor on and turn the video on. And this is, this is hilarious. So. so she has utilized both male and female names. But through all of our investigation to this point, talking with no individuals, interviews, head. documents, Houston Police Department reports. She has been identified this entire time as female, she, her, and so uh, we are identifying her as Gen C. Moreno, Hispanic female. There were two weapons. Yeah, you might, you might, you may not have got the sound, but I think everybody else out there got the sound. Um, it's just basically he's discussing all the different uh, varieties of identity he has, and they can't determine it, but they have chosen to identify he as a she for now. And that's that's 2024 in a nutshell. You know, right there. Whatever. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 843 of Anglican Unscripted.